Hello everyone, we are Karen, Meredith, and Jim, current graduate students in the Medical Genomics Program at the University of Toronto. Meredith and I are in the laboratory stream, and Jim is in the clinical stream. Today we will talk to you about a rare genetic disorder called Prader-Willi syndrome, and walk you through the genetic concepts behind the disorder. Prader-Willi syndrome? Hmm, I don't know too much about that. Hey Jim, as a clinician, do you know anything about this condition? Why yes, I do. Allow me to explain some of the clinical symptoms. As Carrie mentioned, it is a rare complex genetic disorder characterized in infancy by hypotonia, failure to thrive, typically related to poor suck and global developmental delay. Then there are features that become more apparent during childhood, such as short stature with small hands and feet, hyperphagia leading to obesity, and further intellectual disability. As patients reach adulthood, they may show hypogonadism and may exhibit behavioral issues such as obsessive compulsive disorder. Oh, and I heard that it can affect 1 in 10,000 people. Is that right? You are almost correct, Karen. The true prevalence ranges between 1 in 10,000 to 45,000 individuals, depending on the population. And it's actually recognized as the most common syndromic form of obesity, affecting approximately 400,000 individuals worldwide. Wow, I didn't know that. Okay, now that we know a little bit about the phenotype or traits related to the condition, I want to learn about the genetic mechanism. How does Prader-Willi syndrome happen? That's a great question, and the mechanism is quite fascinating. First, you will need to understand the concept of genomic imprinting. Everyone has two copies of each chromosome, one from their father and one from their mother. In most cases, both copies of a chromosome will express the gene it contains. However, genomic imprinting is a remarkable epigenetically regulated process that causes genes to be expressed in a parental or region-specific manner. This means that a gene could be expressed only from the paternally inherited allele while the maternal gene is silenced. Or vice versa, where the maternally inherited allele is expressed and the paternal genes are silenced. This imprinting is established during gametogenesis, where certain genes are methylated, preventing them from being expressed in the resulting embryo, making those genes functionally haploid. This is naturally occurring process in everyone, and does not cause disease on its own. I think I understand. So imprinting silences one copy of a gene, but then there's still a functioning copy inherited from the other parent that's being expressed normally. But that would mean if something were to happen to the one functioning copy, then there would be reduced or no expression at all from that gene. Exactly. So regarding Prader-Willi syndrome, we are interested in looking at chromosome 15. There are regions from band 15Q11 to 13 that contain imprinted genes. As you can see in this figure, the offspring receives two copies of chromosomes 15, one from each parent. Some of the genes on the maternally inherited chromosome 15 are silenced, so they will not be expressed in the child. Instead, the same genes on the paternally inherited chromosome 15 are expressed normally. However, if the paternally inherited copy is mutated and that region is no longer expressed, then the child will have Prader-Willi syndrome. So all cases of Prader-Willi syndrome occur because something goes wrong with the chromosomal region 15q11 to 13, such as a deletion. About 65-75% to 75 of cases, but not all. In rare cases, around 2%, both genes' copies can be methylated. This occurs when there is an imprinting defect on the paternally inherited chromosome 15 region. Another genetic concept that we need to know is uniparental disomy or UPD. This is a term for the phenomena when both homologs of a chromosomal region are inherited from only one parent due to an error in non distinction during meiosis 1 of gamete production. When UPD occurs with imprinted genomic regions, the resulting gamete could have either 
to active expressed parental alleles or to silent repressed parental alleles, leading to the abnormal dosage of imprinted gene products. The extent of UPD can range from a small segment to the whole chromosome. Maternal UPD, of all or part of chromosome 15, can cause parental wheelie syndrome because the resulting offspring will have to imprint chromosome regions with no expression. This occurs in approximately 20 to 30 percent of cases. Finally, there may be a chromosome rearrangement on the paternally inherited chromosome 15, such as a translocation or inversion. A balanced rearrangement can cause less than 1% of predal cases by disrupting the imprinting mechanism causing the paternally inherited copy to be methylated. An imbalanced rearrangement occurs in approximately 1% of cases by causing all or part of the 15Q11 to 13 region to be deleted. Man, that's a lot of information to remember. So all cases of prader willi syndrome are caused by an absence of expression from the chromosome 15q11 to 13 region. Before we move on, do you remember the most common type of mutation responsible for prader willi syndrome? Deletions that include the imprinted region on chromosome 15q11 to q13 are the most common type of mutations found in patients. True or false, prader willi syndrome is paternally inherited. This is true. Although not always inherited, prader willi syndrome is always caused by a missing, deleted, or non-functioning region of chromosome 15 inherited from the father. Most of these mutations arise sporadically during conception. Let's just review all the ways this loss of expression can occur. 65 to 75 percent of cases will be caused by deletion in part of or the whole 15q11 to 13 imprinted region on the paternally inherited chromosome. Approximately 20 to 30 percent will occur due to maternal uniparental disomy. 2 percent are caused by a paternal imprinting defect. 1% of cases are caused by an unbalanced rearrangement on the paternally inherited chromosome. And finally, less than 1% are caused by a balanced rearrangement on the paternally inherited chromosome. Wait, hold on a minute. I think there's another condition that has a very similar disease mechanism to prader willi syndrome. Is that right? Yes, three distinct neurodevelopmental disorders are caused by deletions or duplications that occur at the 15Q11 to 13 locus. prader willi syndrome, Andromen syndrome, and 15Q11 to 13 duplication syndrome. Each of these disorders results from the loss of function or overexpression of at least one imprinted gene. It depends on whether the mutation on chromosome 15 is from the dad or mom. As we just discussed, if the paternal gene is mutated, the patient will have prader willi syndrome. On the other hand, a paternally derived copy of one gene for Andromen syndrome in 15Q is also normally silent, which means if the maternal gene is mutated, the patient will instead have Andromen syndrome. This is another figure. We can see the offspring receive two chromosomes from both parents and the gene from paternal chromosome is silenced. If the father gives the mutated gene to the offspring, they will be considered normal because the mutated gene cannot be expressed. However, if the maternal gene mutated, the offspring will have Andromen syndrome. The mechanism of Andromen syndrome is similar to that for prader willi syndrome. First, a deletion of the maternal 15Q11 to 13 is found in approximately 74% of individuals with Andromen syndrome. Secondly, paternal uniparental disomy is found in approximately 8% of the patients. Thirdly, imprinting defect is found in approximately 7% of the patients. Then, unbalanced and balanced translocation on the maternally inherited chromosome is another mechanism. Finally, 
a loss of function mutation of maternal UVE3A gene, which is also on chromosome 15, is found in approximately 11% of the patients with Angelman syndrome. Would you like me to now explain how to diagnose this condition through genetic testing? No, wait. Karen and I have done some research on the testing methods and treatment. Can we try to explain? Of course, go ahead. Okay, so the first line of testing would be a DNA methylation analysis. This would allow you to see whether there is abnormal parent-specific imprinting within the Prader-Willi critical region. Looking at methylation status alone can establish a diagnosis for over 99% of patients, but will not tell you much about the underlying genetic mechanism that caused it. Since deletions account for most of Prader-Willi cases, you can follow up methylation analysis with a karyotype plus FISH, or a chromosomal microarray. A microarray is more precise and can pick up on microdeletions that FISH could miss. Alternatively, you could do a methylation-specific MLPA, which would detect the abnormal dosage and distinguish a deletion from maternal UPD or an imprinting defect. It can also determine the approximate size of the deletion. If there's no deletion indicated, then you could perform a DNA polymorphism analysis. This would require samples from both parents and will differentiate between cases caused by maternal UPD and imprinting defects. However, a lot of this has been replaced by combining a microarray with an oligosnip array since this would find deletions and approximately 75% of the UPD cases by showing a loss of heterozygosity. Yes, sometimes patients must go through a series of testing before finding the underlying mechanism causing their disease. It can be important to figure out the precise mechanism because it can influence the recurrence risk. For most families, the risk is low at less than 1%, but certain cases, such as an inherited chromosomal rearrangement, can bring the risk up to 50%. Ah, I see. Karen, did you want to explain the treatment options? Yeah, for sure. There is currently no cure for Prader-Willi syndrome, but there are treatments to manage the manifestations. Some examples include using feeding strategies to prevent obesity and close supervision to avoid food stealing. This becomes difficult because patients experience extreme hunger and they only require 60 to 80 percent of the recommended daily allowance for healthy children. Clinical trials are in progress for medications for hyperphagia. Growth hormone treatments are available to normalize height, increase lean body mass, decrease fat mass, and increase mobility. Moving on, there are therapy options including early physical therapy, which can improve issues from hypotonia. There are education management options such as speech therapy and special education. Some patients have responded well to serotonin reuptake inhibitors, which have been shown to be beneficial for their behavioral disturbances, especially for those with OCD or psychosis. Sleep issues can sometimes be resolved with surgically removing the tonsils and adenoids, or with airway assistance like CPAP. Additionally, some experience excessive daytime sleepiness and may benefit from drugs like modafinil. Well said, Karen. Did you happen to stumble upon more information on clinical trials? Yes, I was just about to talk about that. Researchers are focusing on treating the side effects like temper outbursts, anxiety, hyperphagia, and OCD. There was a phase 3 clinical trial in 2019 that treated food-related behaviors in Prader-Willi syndrome patients with levolatide. This was reported in many news articles, however, it was terminated just a year later due to the lack of significant results, since there were no changes. Currently, there is a phase 3 clinical trial that started in 2018 and uses intranasal carbitocin as a treatment for hyperphagia, OCD, and anxiety. At the 8-week mark, there was a reduction in symptoms of hyperphagia, OCD, and anxiety. This clinical trial is still in progress. To test if you were listening, we'll ask another question. True or false? We are very close to a cure for Prader-Willi syndrome. False. Unfortunately, we're not close to a cure. However, there are some great management options available to help improve the quality of life for patients and their caregivers. 
Wow, that's incredible! Thanks for sharing your insight with me, Karen and Meredith. The pleasure was all ours. It was great to learn more about Prader-Willi syndrome together. I agree. With technology advancing in the medical genomics field, there is no doubt that researchers will continue to work hard and continue fighting for the lives of patients with Prader-Willi syndrome.